Good morning everyone and welcome to the next video in the cybersecurity space. In this video we are going to discuss what is ethical hacking. Now take this as an example. There is an organization that keeps on getting compromised or keeps on getting attacked repeatedly every month and they are at a loss of why exactly this is happening. So an employee comes up with a brilliant idea of hiring an ethical hacking or uh, hiring an ethical hacker to test the security systems. The bosses agree and the company ends up hiring an ethical hacker. Now, what this hacker does is they try to test all the security controls that the organization has implemented, all the applications, uh, maybe even the databases, and then they start giving a report. So here you can see that they are trying to test the firewall, uh, maybe fire viruses, malicious queries towards the firewall, hack the company's website, test the company's websites, any applications that the company is utilizing, and try to analyze the responses that they're going to get. So they're trying to emulate a hacker scenario where a hacker is trying to attack and trying to figure out the vulnerabilities and the areas for compromise uh, to the organization's infrastructure. So once the report is ready, they would be submitting the report to the organization and they would then give recommendations of how to enhance the security posture of the organization. Once the security posture is enhanced, the likelihood of the organization getting compromised reduces drastically, thus the organization becomes a lot more secure than it was before. And this is what we are going to discuss in this video. So first and foremost, we are going to discuss uh, what is ethical hacking. We are going to talk about the types of hackers. We are looking at phases of ethical hacking, common types of attacks that are possible on networks and other systems. And then we are talking about certification and job roles in the cybersecurity space as well. So what exactly is ethical hacking? Ethical hacking is locating weaknesses or vulnerabilities of computers and information system using the intent and actions of a malicious hacker. Now the difference here is the intent. A malicious hacker will try to gain something for their own uh, personal gains or try to cause damage to the other organization. Here the intent of the ethical hacker is to identify possible flaws and vulnerabilities, weaknesses and then try to enhance the security on those weaknesses by mitigating those weaknesses thus preventing malicious hackers from getting access. So the intent is the complete other way around where a malicious hacker may be looking at gaining personally from these attacks where an ethical hacker would prevent the vulnerability does prevent the hack from happening in the first place. An ethical hacker is an expert who penetrates a computer system or network on behalf of its owners to find security vulnerabilities that the hacker can exploit. So the difference between the hacker and ethical hacker here is that the hacker is not authorized by the organization whereas in case of ethical hacker it's the organization themselves who have hired the services of the ethical hacker to test the security controls, to test the network, to test applications and find out flaws within them so that they can be fixed. Ethical hacker is also known as a penetration tester. So the job role here is to find vulnerabilities and to fix them so that malicious hackers may not be able to misuse them. What are the advantages of hiring an ethical hacker in an organization? First and foremost, ethical hackers can emulate or simulate the scenarios that a hacker would. They have the same knowledge, might use the same tools, except for the intent. So they will be able to identify the security threats for the organization. Once the th security threats have been mitigated, the organization can actually focus on their business and increase productivity. Once the attacks have been mitigated and the compromises have been minimized, the organization can full-fledged work towards their goals, their objectives of the business and be more productive. The reputation of the company can be safeguarded. We obviously don't want to deal with organizations that keep on repeatedly getting hacked and compromise our data. We wouldn't trust those organizations with our private and personal data in the first place which means that this is going to inspire customer confidence. The customer would feel that if the organization is secure and is able to protect themselves, they would be able to protect the customer's data and customer's uh, private information as well, which is the protection for your customers or clients. So this can be advertised as by the organization saying, we have ethical hackers, we do proactive approach towards our security measures. We have uh, integrated security mechanisms in place. We are safe. We have been tested and we can prove that we are security compliant. Once the customers come to know about this, customers would feel a lot more safer to deal with such organizations. After discussing the advantages of hiring an ethical hacker, let's discuss the types of hackers. The first classification is of a black hat hacker. 
these people are individuals with extraordinary computing skills which means they are very intelligent they can program quite a bit uh, they know everything about hacking and these guys are experts however their intent is malicious or destructive in nature they would want to harm the victim and gain possibly monetarily from these kind of activities some of these people would do it for fun an ego boost if you will the second classification is of a grey hat hacker. These are individuals who work offensively as well as defensively. So at times they can, uh, for an agenda, become a black hat hacker, gain out of it, hack without authorization. And at times they can actually accept a contract from an organization to help them enhance the security of that organization. And then there are white hat hackers. These are individuals professing the same skills that of a black hat or a grey hat. They might use the same tools possess the same knowledge except for the intent. Their intent is not to cause harm but to protect the organization and enhance their security skills. These are people like us. These are ethical hackers who essentially uh, try to emulate or simulate the attacks from a black hat hacker's perspective to find out the flaws and then try to mitigate them, uh, try to enhance the security posture of the organization to prevent that organization from getting hacked. And then there are suicide hackers. These are individuals who bring down critical infrastructure for a cause. The main difference between the black hat hackers and suicide hackers is that black hat hackers will try to hide their identity. Suicide hackers do not. In fact, they will claim responsibility for the attacks that they have done. Then we have script kiddies. These are unskilled hackers. They have no idea what they're doing. They may not be technically very adept, but they rely on tools already created by black hat hackers and then try to use those tools and leverage them to try to hack an organization. A cyber terrorist would be any organization or individual who are motivated by religious or political beliefs and they try to create fear by large-scale disruption of computer networks. So they might attack countries, they might attack organizations to promote their political or religious causes and might create harm to the population at large. State-sponsored hackers are individuals who are employed by the government to spy on neighboring countries or uh, their enemies. The Attempt is to gain top secret information that would be damaging to other governments which would enhance the security posture of one own, one's own country. Now this is not an official job profile but uh, it's a known fact that most of the governments have hired uh, hackers to spy on other countries and other organizations. Then there are hacktivists, individuals who want to promote a political agenda by hacking and defacing websites. These guys do not cripple infrastructure, they just hack websites, deface them, put their own propaganda on the face of the website uh, to promote whatever political messages that they want to uh, promote. Now let's talk about the phases of ethical hacking. Ethical hacking is di distributed into five different phases. They are the reconnaissance phase, scanning, gaining access, maintaining access and covering tracks. The first phase, the reconnaissance phase, is all about information gathering. Here you're trying to identify the target, trying to get to know the target, gathering information about the target. Could be digital in nature, could be any personal information or organizational information that you can leverage later on for social engineering attacks as well. Here you might try to find out from a technical perspective the IP addresses, domain names, subdomains, uh, email addresses, phone numbers of uh, people uh, working in the organization. Once you have all this information, you would then proceed to the scanning phase. We are going to actively scan for devices that are live and can, you can interact with. Then you are going to scan those live devices to identify ports, protocols and services running on those systems. Now these ports or protocols, these would be your entry points to try to gain access to that system. It is here where those flaws would exist. So in this phase, you are basically identifying which ports are open, which services are running on top of them, what protocols are being utilized by the machine. Once you have identified this, you might want to enumerate them by gathering more information from a specific protocol. And then you might want to go into the vulnerability scanning phase where you're going to scan these services, protocols for vulnerabilities, trying to create a list of all the possible vulnerabilities in that system. Once you have the list of possible vulnerabilities, you're going to move on to the gaining access phase where you're going to attack those vulnerabilities, try to exploit them and try to gain access or embed a Trojan virus, keylogger or any software that can spy on the victim. Once you have hacked into this machine, you're going to try to maintain access. Maintaining an access is you're trying to retain those access for a longer period of time so you can spy on the uh, device, spy on the user, uh, try to collect more information as time goes on. You're not going to rely on the hack forever 
because the hack may no longer work after a period of time, especially if the system gets patched up or somebody runs an antivirus scan or figures out something is wrong. Maintaining access is where you're going to install a backdoor, an unauthorized backdoor obviously, uh, without the knowledge of the victim, which will allow you to interact with the machine or gather information from the machine without any hindrance. Once you have installed these kind of softwares, you don't want them to be discovered. That's where the covering tracks come into the picture. When you have installed a rootkit, a trojan, a spyware, it will create directories, it will create files. In this phase, the covering tracks, you're going to try to erase the trace of the creation of these files. When you're accessing something while maintaining access or gaining access, there would be logs that would be created uh, by the applications which would announce what you've been doing. In the covering, covering tracks phase, you will be trying to delete those logs and try to erase the traces of your activity as well. So in these five phases, the entire gambit of ethical hacking is covered. Let's move on to discuss the common types of attacks. The first and foremost and the most common attack in today's world is a denial of service attack or a distributed denial of service attack. This attack is launched by an attacker not to not for personal gain but to harm the other organization by crashing those services or making the services unavailable for legitimate users thus causing monetary harm and reputational harm to the organization. They actually try to restrict the access to these resources for legitimate users by consuming all the bandwidth or the resources made available. Then there are password attacks. These attacks are essentially where you're trying to crack the password of a user so that you can get access to their account and through their access you can then uh, leverage those access and capture data that you wouldn't have otherwise gotten access to. Then man in the middle attack is where you are trying to capture data packets over the network uh, that are flying between the victim and the target server. So you're essentially placing yourself between the communication channel that has been opened between the victim and the targeted server and you're trying to capture the data packets, you're trying to analyze those data packets and capture any secret information like usernames, passwords, any other transactions that the user might be doing. Then you have email attacks. The attacker sends bait often in the form of an email. So these would be a phishing attacks that would come under the gambit of social engineering. Phishing attacks are nothing but fake mails that look very genuine to the end user and thus persuade them to click on links that lead to malicious servers, thus compromising the device of the victim. SQL injection attacks are normally targeted to websites or web applications that have, a, that have a database connected to them. The database and the application interact with each other using SQL language or structured query language. If not configured properly and uh, if there are no firewalls watching, a user can cra craft malicious SQL queries which can then dump data or uh, give out unwanted information to the hacker that should have been protected in the first place. And then if you have the eavesdropping attack where the attacker observes the traffic on the system and works and the work you are doing on your computer. Eavesdropping could be where you're, tra uh, you're tracking VoIP calls or you have installed a Trojan on somebody's mobile phones and you're trying looking at all that information. Let's look at the certifications that are available in this field. The foundational knowledge that you would require is a graduate in computer science or any IT security related field. Most of the univers universities nowadays provide this kind of certifications. You should have solid grounds in IT fundamentals. That means you should be technically very adept. You should understand how protocols work, how networking works. You should be uh, somewhat conversant with some scripting languages and should be able to understand programming. Knowing networking and mastering networking is a very fundamental requirement. Even if you later on decide to go into application security and you're looking at programming languages, applications still work over the network and you need to know how these networks are going to be configured and how data is going to be transmitted over this network. Coding skills. Like I said, programming, not from a developer's perspective, but at least good enough to understand how the program functions, what the flaws may be in the programming code that has been given and how you can break that particular code. That is what is required. A few scripting languages like PHP, Perl, Python, Ruby, uh, they would be a lot helpful at this point in time. Maybe bash scripting or PowerShell scripting as well. And then our understanding of the architecture of an operating system. We just don't want to know how the operating system works and how it functions. We should be able to troubleshoot the operating system to recover from errors, flaws, and we should know how the operating system works, stores data, and interacts with the hardware in, at the first place. With everything, there is now cloud. And cloud is 
gaining traction a lot. We got public clouds like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. We got private clouds like VMware, uh, My Microsoft again, Citrix, and so on and so forth. Most of the organizations in today's world have a hybrid environment where they've got a part physical IT infra and part cloud infrastructure. So learning what cloud is, the nuances of cloud, the services that a cloud can provide, software as a service, infrastructure as a service, and platform as a service, understanding them, and then knowing how you can secure these or what the vulnerabilities are in the first place, and then trying to secure them is of very much a sense in today's world. Over a period of time, you will have to learn cloud security to be relevant in today's world, especially with IoT, artificial intelligence, and machine learning uh, picking up pace and then malware analysis and reverse engineering. So let's say there's a new virus that has been released and there's an antivirus company who's working to figure out how the virus works, what are the signatures that are created by the virus, and this is where those malware analysis skills come into the picture. Even in real terms or in normal terms, if you're working in an organization and if a machine has been infected or is suspected of an infec infection, you need to investigate the machine to identify whether it was a worm, virus, or a trojan, and need to take effective action to prevent further compromise from happening. And that is why uh, mal malware analysis is of importance as well. The certifications that you have, Certified Ethical Hacker, it will train you in reverse engineering. So this is where you basically look at offensive security. This is where you're looking at hacking and you're looking at how uh, the methodologies, the five steps that we have talked about. And this course deals with each and every one of those five steps and helps you analyze and understand the tool sets and the skills that are required for each of that particular step. Salaries may range between 71,000 US dollars and above in the US market and around, around 5 lakh rupees and more in the Indian market. After CEH, we have got the ECSA slash LPT course. ECSA is the EC Council Certified Security Analyst course. Once you get certified on that, you can then apply for the LPT, which is the Licensed Penetration Tester. So it's for CEH, then ECSA, EC Council Certified Security Analyst, and then LPT, Licensed Penetration Tester. This gives Certified Penetration Testers the opportunity to practice their skills and gives you a license where you have uh, and a certificate that proves that you have understood the methodology and are very adept at the skills of hacking. These are the major secure, uh, security certificates that you might want to look at. With that, I thank you for watching this video and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you and bye bye. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.